Do you want to go ahead? And, should we go ahead and start, Aaron? Yeah, I think we should go ahead and start. I think, uh, Craig, there's a few folks still not on mute. You might want to. I think Mark's phone. There you go. Again, we, we're just muting to keep the um, uh, cross noise or interference down, but this really is a public meeting for folks. So we'll, we'll get you guys engaged here uh, throughout the process, so. Yeah, just a, a little quick overview. You know, obviously we're in a Zoom environment. If you have any questions you wanna pose during the session, feel free to use the questions uh, tab and I'll make sure that uh, every uh, question is responded to. And if we run out of time, we'll follow up with you afterwards. Um, you can put these in anonymously if you feel like it. And we are recording this session. And uh, once it's over, we'll uh, add it to the uh, MKGSA's YouTube page and the link to the video will be on the TID website. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Aaron. Thanks, uh, Craig. Can we go to the next slide? Great. For folks just here joining us this evening, I just want to do a quick agenda overview so uh, you guys get an idea of what we're going to be covering today. I think uh, there was a, a couple comments early on or questions, and I've received some phone calls. Um, just so just to clarify, the meeting that we're having today is really to go over the Quia Subbasin Water Marketing Strategy or the development of a program that allows growers that and or beneficial users that receive groundwater credits or allocations to move those around uh, in a discreet um, and packaged manner. And this uh, committee has been established to kind of oversee that process. So this evening, what we wanted to do is uh, welcome the public to this process and introduce you to the uh, committee members that are, are steering this process. Uh, give you an introduction on the water marketing strategy and its background. We did receive some state and federal funding support, so I'll explain that to you in, in the monies that we're receiving. Uh, and then we'll be getting an uh, update or a report on key elements of water markets from around the area and the world, case examples of those water markets. And then we will also describe to you as the public how you can participate in the development of this water marketing strategy. And lastly, this evening, we're joined by the California Water Commission, who's also doing some work with water markets. And uh, they wanted to spend some time with you to introduce what they're looking at and ways that you can help them in their process. So with that, I think the first thing we wanted to do is introduce our chairman, Steve Nelson, who had some opening remarks for the, the public here. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Aaron. I, I just want to uh, thank everybody uh, attending this meeting. This is a high level look at what we're trying to achieve with the Water Marketing Committee. Uh, we're asking for engagement. We're asking for um, follow through, which will be given some uh, links that you could pose questions and or a time slot to make actual phone calls. I'd like to introduce the committee that makes up the Water Marketing Committee, uh, starting with Joe Cardoza. He represents the Greater Cahuilla GSA. Uh, Brian Watson, he represents the East Cahuilla GSA. Scott Rogers represents Tulare Irrigation District. David Cardoza is an ag seat. He represents Cardoza Company. Manuel Leon, a uh, disadvantaged community seat. Uh, he's with Self-Help Enterprises. Sophie Mulholland is our environmental seat. James Silva is a, a water seat, various Cahuilla ditch companies. Chuck Nichols represents the industrial seat, which is Nichols Farms. Craig Wallace is, the, again, a water seat, representing LSID. And finally, Matthew Watkins is another ag seat, which represents B-Sweet Citrus. This is a committee that has been meeting and moving forward with the water marketing uh, concept. Uh, we have hit the accelerator button because we think this is important for the basin and for you as growers uh, and dealing with water. So with that, I'd turn it back over to Aaron. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Craig, we can move to the next slide, which, uh, Steve, that was a good segue in uh, introducing into our accelerated schedule. This is our initial schedule, and I apologize, we don't have the, the quarters got, uh, the dates got chopped off, but if you go to the far right, 
uh, at the end of our schedule. That's about the end of quarter two or the summer of 2022. The reason for, our, for the acceleration of our program is as we look forward in the allocation programs that are now currently being um, developed by the GSAs and the Cahuilla Subbasin, uh, our goal is to make sure that beneficial users in the basin have all the tools they can have at their um, uh, available to them when the allocations start coming out in order to help uh, move water around, uh, meet shortages within a limitation or restriction. So there's a uh, um, different uh, categories within our schedule. We've got our public meetings that we'll be holding. Um, as you can see there in the blue dots, and those are the um, public workshops that we will have. Uh, and after every public workshop, we will have what are called office hours. For those of us that remember from our college days, which was long ago, we can go get help or seek some uh, direction or provide our comments on certain things. And that's what we want to do for the public is hold those meetings, let you digest that information, and then do follow-up meetings. We also have a, the strategy committee, which is the group overseeing the process. They're meeting on a more frequent basis to, to hear the reports, hear the um, direction and provide direction. So we, uh, and then there's some other groups that are working underneath to support those two um, um, uh, meetings. And I'll explain a little bit about that, but you can see the process which we've laid out um, is pretty methodical looking at our water rights, resist, uh, researching existing water markets, which you'll hear some of that here, defining the buyers and the sellers and the roles, um, and looking at some of the impacts and benefits. Um, we will make, be, make sure we develop a legal framework over which this all uh, is overseen. Um, the standard terms, practices, I call this kind of the water marketing uh, guidebook, right? So you're going to open this book and go to page five if you want to know who the, the buyers and sellers are. You're going to go to page six if you want to know how far you can move. Uh, and then we're going to establish an interim water marketing strategy. So how are you going to implement it? Um, and with these coming um, allocations coming out of the GSAs here fairly soon, I know that East Kuya just passed theirs, uh, we might be able to set up a pilot market here uh, early on to test. It's important for everybody to recognize that in the acceleration of putting this together, we're putting this together probably about a year ahead of where we wanted to be, that when we get to a pilot market, um, we'll be learning and, and adjusting that market as we move along. So we don't anticipate a permanent market in place, but a pilot market that we can learn and develop from. Next slide, please, Craig. So how are we organized? Again, um, it is the, the Kuya Subbasin's belief that um, uh, putting all the beneficial users together to develop this uh, helps um, get all the different viewpoints together in one room at one time to develop the, the market. But the three GSAs are supporting that. There are members, again, as was alluded to in the list of committee members, there's uh, members from each GSA representing and supporting the group, and then the public supporting the committee. Um, the project coordination team includes the grant administrators and the GSA managers. So the Tulare Irrigation District is the grant administrator, and I'll explain a little bit about that later. But underneath that, the three GSA managers really support uh, the technical and um, managerial um, needs of this program. And below them, we have access to a legal team, our consultant, which was selected, which is Stantec, and you met Craig Moyle here and uh, Matthew Finup. And then we also have an engineering team. When we need the calculations and the data, we can get that from our engineering team. Next slide. So the roles and the responsibilities. So our, our strategy committee and the members which you've met, uh, they represent the perspectives of the 11 different constituencies or beneficial users of the Cahuilla Subbasin. They were applications were solicited and, and they were selected based on not only their representation of various beneficial users like the environment, disadvantaged communities, ag, industry, um, but also geographically. So we've selected folks from throughout the Cahuilla Subbasin. And these, this group will make the decisions on the proposed water market parameters, the rules and the management. So those 11 members will be the voting members when there's a decision to be made. 
uh, they will consider that and take a vote. And our chairman uh, is Steve Nelson. Then below that, we have a project coordination team, and that includes the grant administrator, the GSA managers, and that, that technical and legal team. Again, our uh, I'm part of that project coordination team. Uh, what we're charged with is managing the activities directed by the stre uh, strategy committee. So if the strategy committee needs support on a specific item in research, we will be responsible for putting that together. We prepare all the materials for the strategy committee and for their consideration. Uh, we facilitate the coordination among technical and legal teams. So information that needs to get passed through questions, we will, we will get those answered. And then uh, the irrigation district and my other role that I play here will uh, administer the consultant contracts uh, that oversee this work. The Stantec team, uh, they are there to prepare the interim materials and final water marketing strategy document, that, that guidebook that we're talking about, and then keep the uh, uh, group uh, informed with timely information for their consideration. And then they also provide support for our public workshops such as this. Craig was uh, the mastermind, the, the guy with all the controls over this Zoom workshop and, and how easily it's working. Our engineering team uh, currently uh, is some of our uh, engineers in the local area that are helping us with our GSA work. So uh, Montgomery and Associates and Provost and Pritchard will be pitching in. Uh, and they're really helping us at our individual GSA levels, working on our water allocation and, and our water accounting framework. And then lastly, uh, our legal teams at our GSAs will provide support when needed and called upon. Uh, they provide the legal guidance on water supplies available for the market, the limitation, the constraints and strategy, uh, constraints and uh, what the committee's requirements are. Next slide. So the strategy committee and the noti public notification. Uh, the strategy committee is an ad hoc committee of the GSA boards. So we're not really subject to the Brown Act, but, um, but our strategy committee meetings will be noticed and conducted as though they are Brown Act meetings. And we believe that adds a level, the highest level of transparency we can have for our public. So you'll be able to see our agendas, see our materials and uh, participate in that um, process. The discussion will be recorded and posted on meetings on the Midquia GSA YouTube channel. Um, how the easiest way to get it is through the Tulare Irrigation District website. You can link to the Mikuia GSA YouTube channel. Um, the project coordination and team meetings, um, um, the extent of public stakeholder notification to desired level of public stakeholder uh, um, involvement. So it's, it's dependent upon that. Next slide. So I wanted to give folks a little bit of um, idea. I wanted to first kind of explain to you how uh, we got to the, the concept of a water marketing strategy. Um, and it kind of starts uh, just ahead of the grants. Um, you know, as many of us developed our GSPs, included in those GSPs were water markets. Um, however, they were only there in concept under management actions. And in 2000, uh, 19, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation offered a grant uh, for uh, consideration of a water marketing strategy. And as many of you know, we were all pushing really hard to get our GSPs completed by January 2020. And so the GSAs were not in a, in a position to apply for the grant. And so Tulare Irrigation District uh, asked the other GSAs if, if they were willing to support the application of a water marketing strategy. And the, the goal was um, there, there needed to be a thoughtful process to develop a water marketing strategy that looks at uh, ensuring that the natural resource and the trading of that natural resource is in the best interest of all the beneficial users in the subbasin, and that the public is able to participate in that process so that there's no, we limit the unintended consequences or avoid them altogether. So the idea here is to develop a strategy that all of our folks can um, utilize and that we can stand by that are not creating undesirable results out there in the Kuya subbasin as we start to move water around. And when I say we move water around, there's, there's also the underlying concern that we're trying to move money around in our economy and that if you keep the money flowing, our economies will stay intact. 
as we look to reduce the amount of agricultural footprint there is in the Kuya Subbasin. So um, TID staff had some extra time, <laughs> very little, and I, I give our uh, Jeremy Barrow, who's on our barrel, who's on our call. I asked him, "Hey, are you up for putting this application in?" And he said, "Sure." Um, one of his first grant applications. And so we submitted that grant application and to our surprise, we, we received a, a notice of award. So it's a financial assistance agreement with the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and it's really there to, to seek to assist water managers for projects that can serve and use water more efficiently. But what we're using it for is to investigate and develop a water marketing strategy. Um, and you can see the other goals there, prevent water related crisis and accomplish other benefits to increase reliability of existing supplies. So the grants for um, a, the project is about an $800,000 project and the Bureau of Reclamation is providing about half of that uh, to uh, the program. Next slide, please. We did uh, upon, um, you know, when you write a grant application, you have, you put your plan together and it's your best concept of what you're going to do, but often as you start moving through the program, you find you're going to do it a different way. Uh, and when we secured our consultant um, and started meeting with the committee, there was a need to move the process much faster and get to an accelerated water marketing strategy so that we have those tools ready, as I stated before. So we found ourselves in a position of being a little bit over budget. And um, so we applied for a Department of Water Resources Facilitation Services program um, funding, and we received that. Um, so we'll be using that number, uh, that those uh, dollars to help pick up the outreach cost, which is important for this program to be successful. So your participation, your input um, is critical to making sure that we've covered all of the issues that we could think of when developing a water marketing strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So I think um, we'll we'll pass it on here. Or Craig, should we stop for questions at this point? If yeah, just want to check in with the uh, group if there's any clarifying questions thus far on either uh, Aaron or Steve Nelson's uh, presentations. If you do, just go ahead and unmute yourself or use the hand raise function. Well, I. I appreciate no questions, but I would appreciate a few questions too if anybody had any. You can yeah. send them in the chat or send them in the email. Uh, send me an email also on the side. Yep, or the uh, question and answer tab um, on your dashboards. Okay, Matthew, why don't you go ahead and start? Great, great. Um, so it's it's really great to be here. Uh, and so uh, my goal uh, just for the next. Uh, bit next part of this presentation is sort of really to sort of give you food for thought and uh, to sort of uh, just highlight that in developing a water marketing strategy, we don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel, that there's a lot of examples to look for out uh, in, uh, in, in the world uh, and, and that we want to cast as broad a net as possible, right? One of our goals is to, uh, is to really uh, learn everything we can about the markets that are out there and then really engage with stakeholders and ask the question, what are the goals and objectives? What are the things you hope to accomplish? What are the things you, it's really important that we avoid in the design of a water marketing strategy? And, and to be guided by that as we uh, start to select from examples that we see elsewhere. Uh, and so I'm gonna walk through uh, a number of examples and the key elements of markets that are currently operating in other parts of the state, the nation, and the globe. Um, just to back up one step from that, just as a quick introduction, um, um, my background uh, is that uh, I was engaged in a stakeholder-led process uh, in Fox Canyon. Fox Canyon is in Ventura County, California, so coastal Southern California, uh, and it was actually prior to Sigma during the last drought that uh, stakeholders in Ventura County started to think a lot about a cap and trade system, a system by which they could cap total extraction and transfer allocation in order to give water users greater, greater flexibility in that region. And so uh, I, was, I had the privilege of 
being involved at a grassroots level for about 18 months, uh, talking to individual stakeholders uh, about you know, their goals and objectives for a trading strategy in Fox Canyon. And then I uh, facilitated a seven month long uh, formal stakeholder process uh, to design what became uh, the Fox Canyon water market. We've now been operating for a number of years uh, and have enjoyed uh, what we think is, is significant success, you know, very robust participation by um, agricultural stakeholders and now tremendous interest on the part of uh, urban water users to participate in that market. Uh, and so uh, just as a starting point for all of this, I really believe uh, that in order for water, a water marketing strategy to be successful, it must be stakeholder led. Uh, and so we're really interested in the months ahead to hear from you uh, and to be engaged in a really candid conversation uh, with all of you, again, about, about what your goals are and what your fears are uh, in this process. And you can go to the next slide, Craig. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, I, I just want to talk about what we mean by a water market, right? The words water market might mean a number of different things in different settings. And we mean this in the simplest terms, right? So when we talk about a water market, uh, and, and eventually developing a strategy for a water market um, uh, in the Cahuilla Subbasin. You know, we're simply talking about a cap and trade system. And so the three essential elements at their most basic are just a cap on total extraction, right? This is already provided for us by Sigma, defined as sustainable yield. That's a cap on groundwater extraction. Uh, an allocation system as you know, a system of dividing that up, that uh, cap up and assigning it to specific entities. They could be entities, parcels, or wells, depending on how they're assigned, but, but allocating that pumping among water users. Obviously, the sum of those individual allocations needs to equal the cap, and then a system for transferring allocation among water users. Uh, and that, in, that involves rules, structures, and operating mechanisms, which facilitate trade and, and protect against unintended consequences. Uh, but that's all we mean in its most in its simplest form. As I walk through some examples of um, structures and operating mechanisms, you know, and key elements of other wa other water markets, uh, um, you know, what's important to realize is that these are the, the the essentials. But water markets take very very many forms, right? From the from very very informal, uh, you know, there's plenty of water markets in in California where uh, that, yeah, especially in adjudicated basins where, uh, you know, you would call it a coffee shop uh, market, you know, where, where people who need a little extra water and people have a little water to sell often meet, you know, at, at the weekly coffee that growers attend, right? Uh, and, and negotiate how to transfer allocation. And then some of these are the other end of the spectrum, very formal centralized markets with very elaborate and sophisticated trading structures. And so uh, as I walk through all of those different examples, um, uh, it, it can actually be a little overwhelming. But what I, I want to remind is, is that water markets will look different everywhere, right? Based on the unique needs uh, of water users in a specific region. And so the goal again is to develop uh, clearly defined goals and objectives, and then to design a strategy which which suggests specific structures and rules to achieve those goals and objectives. And so this is sort of the menu uh, that we'll be choosing from. I should also add before I jump into the first example that this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, and so what you're about to see is a list, and actually you can go to the next slide, Craig, um, is that the, what you're going to see represented here um, you know, is, a, is a few dozen uh, water markets. It's certainly not all of them. But these are the ones about which there's, there's significant publicly available information about how these work uh, and what the structures are that support trade. And so um, the individual names are not that important. Um, this is here for your reference. Uh, and if there's particular ones that, that individuals you know, might know something about or have questions about, uh, we can address those um, in another form. But, but the survey that I've conducted involves 19 California adjudicated basins. This is not all of the adjudicated basins. There's uh, 23 or 24 at last count, but there's 19 of, of adjudicated basins that have institutions for trade. An adjudicated basin is where individual water rights holders have gone to court 
uh, in order to settle disputes over water rights and the court has issued a judgment um, on who has the right to water. Uh, and 19 of those uh, 20 some adjudicated basins actually have trading institutions of one sort or another. Um, I'm also surveying here, uh, you see seven different water markets from outside um, those adjudicated basins, uh, from the Western United States, Texas, Nebraska, Oregon, uh, Nevada, you know, most of these, all of these are in the Western United States, uh, and two water markets uh, in other countries, one in Chile and Australia. Go ahead to the next slide, Craig. So uh, of all these different markets, there's sort of some key elements uh, of those market structures, and then uh, a number of patterns in how they, uh, what, uh, you know, how these particular elements are realized. So the basis, you know, sort of the foundation for uh, any water market is, is uh, I mentioned the cap and then the allocation system, right? First of all, obviously we need a cap. Uh, there's no need for a water market, obviously, if there's no cap because a market requires scarcity, right? If, if total pumping is not capped, there's no scarcity, you don't need a market. Uh, and so that means once the cap is in place, the method of allocation becomes sort of the, the basis uh, for the water market. Now, uh, of the various water markets uh, that we're considering here today, there's two basic approaches to allocation. One is a, an allocation system based on historical use, and then uh, another system which is really based on some form of equal apportionment of water. Uh, the reality is that the overwhelming majority are based on some historical use. Uh, in fact, most of the California's adjudicated basins uh, fall into this category. And so you see here, uh, basins that allocate groundwater use based on historical use often target the historical use over some historical period. Uh, it might be uh, actually in, in a couple, Beaumont and Mojave, it is the maximum annual extraction ever, right? Over the life of a property. It's the most water uh, base that, that that individual parcel has ever used um, over the life of the parcel. Uh, there's also highest extraction over uh, uh, a five-year period, right? So over a historical period, but by far the most common is an average annual extraction over a historical base period. For example, in Fox Canyon, we actually use the five years prior to the implementation of Sigma as the five-year historical period. In many cases where an adjudication has happened, it's the five years prior to of the initiation of the adjudication that's used as that base period. And then individuals are allocated uh, based on that historical use. There are some examples where um, there's equal shares. There's actually a couple adjudicated basins. You see here Puente, where it's just an equal share. Everyone gets the same amount of water. You know, you di essentially divide the total cap by the number of users. And a user could be an individual or a parcel or a well, depending on the situation. Uh, and then interestingly, there's two basins um, that try to confront the significant challenge of monitoring groundwater use by not actually allocating water use per se, but allocating irrigated acreage. Uh, and so in the Scott River Valley in Northern California and the Twin Platte in Central Nebraska, they actually cap um, the, the number of irrigated acres. And if someone wants to bring an additional acre into production, they essentially have to pay someone else not to irrigate uh, an acre. And then because in these places, the, the cropping patterns are fairly homogenous, the water use is fairly homogenous across space. Um, what they find is that this is a very low cost way of capping and allocating groundwater. Uh, Craig, go ahead to the next slide. Within an allocation system, uh, in, me in every one of these regimes that we're talking about, um, they're facing um, reduced water availability over time. Obviously, if we were to um, uh, operate in uh, the Cahuilla Subbasin and issue everyone the maximum extraction that a parcel has ever used over the life of the parcel, when you added up all of those allocations, it would be significantly higher than sustainable yield, right? And there would need to be a ramp down period where everyone cuts water in order to achieve that. Uh, and so in these regimes of reduced water availability, allocation flexibility 
um, sometimes becomes important, especially in basins that are facing the most dramatic cuts. And so we see a number of approaches to creating additional flexibility beyond the ability to engage in market transfers to buy or sell allocation. And so um, allocation carryover or storage um, is one very common approach. Uh, in the central Kansas water bank, um, an individual can bank up to 25% of an unused water right. So they can't bank 100% of it for use in the future year. They can only bank 25%. If they use 60%, Right, not uh, they lose the 15% from 60 to 75%. They could have pumped, they can only bank 25% in a given year. Uh, in Fox Canyon uh, and in the adjudicated basin of Seaside, they actually allow carryover of up to 100% of, a, of um, annual allocation can be carried over. So if you conserve water today, you can carry that allocation over and use more than your allocation um, in a future dry year. Uh, one other approach here you see retain 75% of saved water um, with conservation or efficiency. So they can retain up to 75 in that case. Um, interestingly, a lot of these with carryover and storage credits, we'll talk about protections at the end, um, protections against unintended consequences. A lot of these involve um, uh, an expiration rate. You can't simply carry it over forever. There's a reality that when it's in the ground, it's moving through the ground and over time, um, uh, that water's gone. So, um, in addition to carryover, there are a few basins that allow borrowing. You can actually pump more today and agree in the future to, to reduce pumping more. Uh, and so you see here three adjudicated basins have provisions to borrow from the future. Um, this is one that really um, sort of caused anxiety in Fox Canyon, you know, in a regime of reducing pumping over time and the possibility of future severe droughts. Um, there was concern about running a credit limit, um, uh, but nonetheless, borrowing is allowed in three basins. And then there's some other ones that involve, it's almost a hybrid, a rolling average. So in Beaumont, Santa Paula, West San Bernardino, you can actually use five times your annual allocation over any five-year period. You could pump five times your allocation in year one and not pump for four years, right? You can also accrue unused allocation for four years and pump extra in your fifth. Uh, and so these are just examples of additional flexibility provided within an allocation system so that not all flexibility has to come from market transfers. Uh, the next ones are, uh, we'll move pretty quick. Uh, you know, one of the things that a market needs uh, as a prerequisite for a, a well-functioning market is a clearly defined unit of trade. Uh, and so uh, the most common one is simply one acre feet of pumping. Uh, and so uh, a number of water markets simply use that. An acre foot of pumping is the unit. You can buy and sell allocation, allocations in units of one acre foot. Uh, and interestingly, sometimes it's one acre foot to be used this year. Uh, that's what it is in Fox Canyon. Uh, in a number of markets, you can actually lease water for this year, or you can buy permanent allocation. You can buy the right to use an acre foot of allocation every year from the futures. In other words, you can transfer the permanent use of that acre foot. Uh, there's also obviously an acre foot of surface water. And then as I mentioned earlier, there's a number of uh, uh, two groundwater markets that instead of trading water directly actually traded irrigated acreage. And so you can buy and sell uh, an acre of um, irrigated ground. Terms of transfers can be uh, temporary or permanent or temporary and permanent. Uh, so temporary transfers are often one to five years, right? You can, obviously, if you're in Fox Canyon, if you're uh, buying an acre foot of water, it's to be used in this year. If you're in the um, uh, Santa Paula Basin, um, you're, you, with a five-year rolling average, you buy it this year and it can be used anytime in the next five years. Um, there are also, those are temporary transfers to be used uh, in the near future. There's also permanent transfers of allocation. Uh, permanent only, right? You cannot buy it just for this year. You have to buy it in perpetuity or not at all. Um, and so you see those uh, in the middle. And then there's uh, a number of basins. Most California adjudicated basins actually have the opportunity to either temporarily purchase allocation or permanently. Now, as these transfers are happening, whether they're temporary or permanent, um, there's two basic types of exchanges, ways that uh, those transfers of allocation happened. I'll start uh, actually at the bottom with a simple one here. There's a, there are informal 
markets, right? Most California adjudicated basins have a water master and that's, and then they have provisions that allow allocation to be transferred between water users, but all of the execution of a transfer has to be handled informally. That means if someone needs to buy water, they have to go out in the community and, and search for someone who has water available for sale. Once two parties, a buyer and a seller find one another, they have to negotiate the price of that transfer privately between the individuals. And then they have to submit paperwork to the water master uh, to consider and approve that transfer. And in many cases, informal markets, you know, the, uh, it can take months to years uh, for an individual transfer to actually be executed. Um, there is one step above that where there's uh, uh, some basins have developed electronic bulletin boards where willing buyers and willing sellers can post that they have water to sell or water to, uh, that they need, they would like to purchase water and contact information. And then uh, uh, water users can visit those bulletin boards, learn about what's out there and then contact those individuals and then do the price negotiation and the paperwork um, offline um, uh, in the background. There's also formal centralized exchange and these take a number of forms. So these are formal centralized, you know, systematic approaches. Uh, and the goal with, with most of these formal exchanges is to reduce all of the, um, um, all the transaction costs associated with a transfer. And transaction costs in this case means you know, the cost of searching for buyers and sellers, the cost of learning what the value of a water right is and negotiating the price for a transfer, the transaction cost of, of um, running the regulatory process and getting approval for a transfer. And, and of course, the uh, transaction costs associated with the actual financial transacting, um, the change of funds between buyers and sellers. And so formal markets are generally built in order to reduce those transaction costs. Uh, uh, there are agency operated exchanges. So in central Kansas, the central Kansas water bank authority runs uh, a formal exchange. In this case, it's the agency. It's, you can think of this as the regulatory body that's setting the rules actually operates um, the exchange. Um, there's also third party administrators. Uh, and so Fox Canyon, um, I am actually the exchange administrator for the Fox Canyon water market. Uh, and in that situation, it was essential to, it was very important to uh, local stakeholders that the exchange operate outside of the local GSA uh, in Ventura County. Uh, it was sort of seen by the growers that it was important for the, for the administrator to be apart from the regulator and also to be nonprofit and sort of be an objective third party, uh, a local entity that operated that. Um, in the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia, there's a number of third party um, exchanges of all kinds. There's very, very elaborate electronic exchanges, sort of like the eBay of water. In fact, in many basins, there are multiple competing exchanges on which water can be bought and sold. Uh, and then in the Twin Platte, um, actually the Fox Canyon water market was heavily influenced by the Twin Plat, um, it's a single nonprofit uh, exchange administrator um, that facilitates transfers of irrigated acreage. One other model, and I'll come back to this at the end, you can see on the, the, the menu on the left-hand side there, uh, it says a special case at the bottom. One other special case is that there's, that there's um, real interest and in, in growing interest in environmental markets and in markets, water markets that are designed to secure um, water for nature. Uh, and there's a few really interesting examples of this where water trusts are set up almost like land trusts in order to secure water for nature. And in that case, in, many, in, in a lot of those cases, the actual water trust itself is the one that's creating the opportunity for, um, for uh, transfers of groundwater pumping. The Oregon Freshwater Trust and the Scott River Water Trust are examples of that. In Santa Paula, there's a, that's an adjudicated basin in Ventura County. It's an interesting situation with after the adjudication in which the uh, water master um, established rules, or rather the court established rules to allow transfers, um, 
agricultural stakeholders realized that the, that the transaction costs of, of finding willing buyers and sellers, ex executing transfers were very, very high. And so they actually formed an agricultural water co-op, uh, which is essentially a pooling of allocation among agricultural water users so that the co-op could actually handle transfers, price negotiation, and execution of paperwork. Uh, and so there's a number of cases where co-ops or, or, and water trusts have sort of solved the problem of, uh, of significant transaction costs. Uh, and so these are all of the various forms uh, that we see in the, in the few dozen water markets that we've seen so far. Now, within an exchange, whether it's informal or formal, obviously um, uh, one of the most common rules uh, uh, is a limitation on trade based on geographic area. Uh, and so a number of basins where there's a basin wide water market, whether it's facilitated formally or informally, um, have geographic limits on uh, the ability to transfer. Uh, and so you see here a number of flavors of this. Some are as simple as discreetly defined geographic areas in which um, tra trading can be allowed. So uh, sub areas within a particular basin might allow transfer only within the sub area, but not um, across the sub area boundary. Uh, in Fox Canyon, we call these special management areas. These sub, uh, these sub areas are actually defined based on hydrologic conditions. So we have a sub area, uh, a special management area protecting a pumping trough where local pumping levels um, are uh, depressed. We also have a seawater intrusion area and those geographic, the boundaries of the seawater intrusion area actually restrictions on the ability to transfer water. Uh, there's also buffers around municipal wells. Uh, Twin Platte does something really interesting to address concerns about shallow municipal groundwater low, uh, wells and disadvantaged communities. And they actually establish a buffer area around those municipal wells where uh, limiting transfers so that third party transfers can't um, reduce those, uh, the water levels within those shallow municipal wells. There's also directional restrictions. Um, the Edwards Aquifer, uh, this is uh, uh, pioneered this uh, where they actually use directional restrictions on trade in order to protect uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems, riparian habitat. Uh, and so there's a river that flows along one boundary of the Edwards Aquifer and uh, there's directional restrictions where pumping can be transferred away from uh, the river, but pumping cannot be transferred in the direction of the river, right? Because that would uh, potentially impact uh, stream flows in that river. Uh, Fox Canyon also uses directional restrictions with the goal that um, transfers of pumping uh, in, Fox, in those special management areas in Fox Canyon might only not make conditions worse, they might actually improve water quality and improve water levels. And so uh, in Fox Canyon, we actually combine special management areas and directional restrictions uh, in, in an effort to positively impact uh, water quality. And then lastly, uh, our exchange rates. So, so in, in the Twin Platte, they also have a river that flows along one boundary uh, of that region of the basin. Uh, and so again, they're using um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, irrigated acreage as a unit of trade. And instead of trans and having directional restrictions, they say, well, you can actually move pumping towards the river, but in order to do that, you're gonna have to retire perhaps two acres of uh, irrigated land away from the river in order to increase the amount of acreage near the river by one. Right? And so they use, it's not necessarily two to one, they have a number of rules, but. Uh, but um, they actually use exchange rates in order to, Im to limit the impact of transfers of pumping um, to the environment. Uh, one key concern in basins that are engaged in, in um, transfers of pumping is obviously the monitoring of water use. Uh, you know, the moment that we engage in market transfers of groundwater pumping, Right, there becomes tremendous concern that water use be accurately measured. Now, the reality is this, this concern is a primary concern under Sigma, whether a basin uh, engages in transfers or not, but there's no doubt that the accurate monitoring water use becomes acutely important uh, in basins that um, seek to develop systems for market transfers of pumping. You know, the transfer of pumping, for, there, there's financial concerns uh, because obviously if someone is, 
uh, you know, cheating the system, pumping more than their allocation, they're devaluing someone else's asset. There's also just a simple accountability that when a transfer happens, it's essential to know that the person selling has actually retired that pumping. There's also significant uh, management concerns because of in potential impacts to disadvantaged communities and, uh, and also to um, groundwater dependent ecosystems. And so monitoring of use becomes important. There's a number of approaches, as there are with every single other one of these elements of, of market design. Um, there are a number of basins that use metering, where uh, individuals have in situ metering on uh, wells, and then in most cases, self-report. This is a, a system that's used in Kansas as well as in Australia. Uh, the Mojave Basin, which is a uh, adjudicated basin, allows farmers to opt into either metering or a pump test where uh, there's actually an electric voltage sensor uh, and they use an alternate means to try and estimate water use. And so growers have a choice between uh, monitoring uh, regimes. Fox Canyon has chosen to do something really unique. Uh, uh, in fact, I'm not aware of anyone else that's doing it this way, which is that they're, they've been using metering since the 1980s uh, and metering and self-reporting as was as is used in Kansas and Australia. Uh, but there was plenty of evidence that that uh, people were under-reporting water use. Uh, and so once we engaged in a process to design a system for transferring pumping, growers became acutely worried about cheating on the part of other water users. And so it was actually the agricultural community in Ventura County that um, insisted that there be universal automated metering. And so we actually use a system where we use cellular telemetry to monitor groundwater meters in real time. And then um, the electronic reporting of pumping is an automated process that happens uh, both to the GSA and to the uh, water market exchange administrator. Uh, in the twin plant where they're using irrigated acres, they actually use annual flyovers and aerial imagery. It's a, a simpler unit of trade. Um, and so um, uh, they, that's their system for documenting irrigated acres. And then obviously right now there's an intense interest in California and elsewhere uh, in this emerging uh, technological revolution in the area of remote sensing. Uh, and so there's a lot of interest in satellite remote sensing. There's a number of vendors uh, providing um, you know, ETO based evapotranspiration based remote sensing of uh, water use. Uh, and so this is one that, that, um, that Aaron can talk about in a future workshop, if not this one, uh, about its possible use. Uh, it's one that you'll hear in other basins in California. Um, I do think it's important for uh, stakeholders considering the use of satellite remote sensing to understand that it is not direct measurement, right? It actually involves a model and estimates of water use. Uh, and so uh, there's even a paper in 2021 um, that was released um, that compared remote sensing measurement or estimation to direct measurement. Uh, and they actually concluded in that paper that the measurement error is significant enough that it may actually limit basin's ability to mitigate impacts to the environment uh, and to third parties. Uh, but nonetheless, this is, this is one, an important uh, set of tools that uh, will need to be considered throughout California. Now, uh, with an allocation system and then a system for transferring allocation, obviously there needs to be a system for enforcing those allocations. Uh, and obviously the most common um, form uh, of enforcement is a penalty for anyone who pumps more than their allocation. Uh, and there's a number of uh, different penalty uh, levels. Most of these are tied to the cost of, of replenishment, the cost of importing water to replace the additional pumping. Uh, and you can see these range from a couple thousand dollars. I think in Fox Canyon, um, ours is tied to the um, tier three import price of water from Metropolitan Water District. You know, in severe drought conditions, it can be over $3,000 an acre foot. Uh, and so there's, these are the penalties for pumping more than your allocation. In most of California's adjudicated basins, there's not actually a financial penalty the individual who is over pumped is simply referred to the court and then the court has the ability to sanction that individual and to, um, and to limit pumping in the future. 
Now with all these different elements of a water market, this menu of different choices that water users and, uh, and regulators need to make in the design of a marketing strategy, obviously one of the primary concerns is the protection of third parties. Right, the protection of uh, uh, the prevention and mitigation of, of unintended impacts of transfers of groundwater pumping. And the things that uh, the most obvious candidates for protection, the ones that really need to be thought about long and hard are small farming operations, shallow municipal wells and disadvantaged communities that they support and the environment broadly um, uh, with groundwater dependent ecosystems of, of particular interest. And so uh, these are concerns that every single water marketing strategy has to come to grips with. These are concerns that stakeholders in every basin considering uh, water markets uh, really needs to think long and hard about. Uh, in the case of small farmers, you know, one of the concerns is that uh, in a basin with a system to transfer water, it will actually be um, those who hold very, very large allocations or those that are very large um, agribusinesses will essentially dominate market activity, either control the price of water so that they can extract all of the economic gains from transfers, or more importantly, those large operators may actually have the ability to limit the participation of small farmers. So one significant concern is that small farmers need to be given the same opportunity to benefit from trade, as well as be protected from um, unintended impacts of trade. Uh, and so one of the dominant strategies um, to address this is anonymized markets. Um, Twin Platte in central Nebraska uh, was one of the pioneers in this area, and it's a model that Fox Canyon followed where um, the indi individual counterparties don't actually know who's on the other side of a trade. They don't know who they're buying from or selling to um, so that those powerful actors can't um, restrict the participation of others. Uh, in terms of protecting uh, shallow municipal wells and disadvantaged communities, management areas, buffer zones and directional restrictions have been shown to be um, uh, uh, capable of addressing those. I mentioned in Twin Platte, they have buffer zones around shallow municipal wells. And then I already highlighted uh, in the case of Edwards and some of the other um, uh, markets where expiration rates management areas have been used to uh, in order to protect the environment and groundwater dependent ecosystems specifically uh, and so this is really one of the uh the important areas for consideration and frankly it's these concerns that that really in most basins guide the decision of some of the other elements of the market what is um, allocation flexibility what are the terms of transfer are they temporary or permanent is it a formal centralized exchange or not? It's actually concerns for these uh, parties that actually may drive some of the decisions around the specific form of market um, that another basin implements. Matthew, we have a question from Peter Nelson. Not sure if you want to hold right. this until after you're done or respond to it now. Um, is uh, it in the Q&A or is it in yeah, the chat? This question here is, in your experience, what have been groundwater allocations to disadvantaged communities within these water markets? per capita, acreage-based, ET-based, have these allocations been more than the general allocations for ag and m and I? Oh, so this is a great question. So an interesting one um, is that, uh, um, and so, uh, so a caveat, and then and I'll provide some comments. So, um, so in Fox Canyon, uh, uh, we actually don't have disadvantaged communities or shallow municipal wells. In our case, the municipalities are, uh, are large, cities that actually have wells. Uh, and in our case too, uh, you know, uh, one of these is a question for the legal team is that uh, uh, in most cases, municipal systems are often appropriators of water, right? Uh, and, so, um, and so in Fox Canyon, we have a unique situation where the cities actually have um, a, a, a water right that's equivalent to the overlying um, agricultural pumpers and they received allocation in the uh, allocation system. Now, in the case of disadvantaged communities in the Central Valley, it's really, really, really important to have disadvantaged communities at the table during the design of the allocation system. And it's important to give those disadvantaged communities allocation, right? You know, uh, uh, it, a potentially damaging um, 
situation would be if a disadvantaged community was required to go to market in order to, to secure water for basic needs. Uh, and so the allocation system needs to provide water for disadvantaged communities. In terms of these adjudicated basins, um, what's interesting is that um, there are, I am not aware of any of the 19 adjudicated basins actually having calling out specific provisions for disadvantaged communities. What you have instead is simply that, you know, well owners um, uh, are parties to the adjudication. And as long as they have a well, they're treated as equivalent to the other well owners uh, in the adjudication. And that means that if the system went historical, it's historical for all well owners, right? Whether that's a shallow municipal well or that's a uh, uh, that's an agricultural pumper. Uh, if it went uh, it, and actually in in most of the equal apportionment, um, uh, those do not apply to uh, uh, to my knowledge to disadvantaged communities because most of the equal apportionment are actually in basins where they had only a few uh, water rights holders and they were a few very large water rights holders. Uh, and, and so many of the uh, equivalent equal port apportionment are actually that a very different situation. Uh, and so uh, to answer that question, I think it's important to consider the needs of disadvantaged communities in the initial allocation. Now uh, we'll do special case and then we're gonna jump to, um, we'll jump to a broad Q and A. Um, and so I just want to highlight this. I mentioned it briefly earlier, but if you could go to the next slide, Craig, um, there is uh, one special case. You know, it's interesting as, as, as I've um, heard, um, you know, been to different congresses and, and symposia and um, different uh, gatherings of water users in various settings, uh, uh, association meetings and others, where people are talking about water markets. If I heard meetings of the California Water Commission, you know, obviously there's a lot of concern on the part of environmental water users that, that ultimately systems of transferring pumping could do damage uh, to the environment. And there's no case, there's no doubt that that, that that potential exists and needs to be addressed and mitigated. I think an interesting counterpoint though is that, uh, is that we should aspire for even better outcomes, right? It's one thing to simply say, we want a, a water market strategy to do no harm to the environment or to do no harm to disadvantaged communities. The reality is that well-designed markets have the potential to actually make the uh, basins healthier, right? To improve environmental outcomes. And one example of this are the, are the environmental water markets that I discussed earlier. So the Oregon Freshwater Trust and the Scott River Water Trust are famous examples of these. And these are where um, environmental stakeholders recognized that there was a need to secure water. In these cases, these are both surface water um, markets, uh, and there was a need to secure stream flows, in-stream flows for migrating fish populations. And so for both the Oregon Freshwater Trust in the Willamette Valley and the Scott River Water Trust in Northern California, uh, a uh, environmental group set up a, a water trust. In the case of the Scott River Water Trust, it was set up with the help of the Nature Conservancy. And they actually created the marketplace where they um, could meet with local uh, irrigators and actually negotiate for diversion rights. You know, they essentially said, you know, what would it take for you to forego diversions during this time of year when fish are migrating? And then they engage in the both permanent and temporary transfers in order to secure water for nature. Uh, and so that's to say, as we consider, um, uh, as we consider all of the protections that are necessary to build in, you know, uh, it's actually possible to aspire uh, to a situation where markets actually, market transfers of pumping actually produce better outcomes for nature and perhaps even better outcomes for disadvantaged communities um, as we go forward. Uh, now, this is a huge list. So one of the goals of this presentation was to totally overwhelm you with all of the different uh, systems, <laughs> all the different strategies that are being employed, all the different structures and the rules. In terms of rules, we've only scratched the surface. There's, there's many, 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 many rules that fit within some of these other elements of the water market. And so part of this was to just really get your, your minds turning uh, and to overwhelm you with sort of the broad set of choices. In terms of how we see this information, is our goal is to 
is to now push this into the background. Uh, you know, our initial goal here in the next few weeks and months uh, designing this water market strategy is to now engage with stakeholders and to say, what is it that you hope to accomplish and what is it that, that we need to avoid? What, 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 what are your goals and what are your fears? And then to look back at this menu and to find the specific market structures and rules that would support those goals and objectives. Right? And so that's really the goal, how we hope um, this information will be used going forward so that stakeholders can suggest a particular market structure and set of rules that, and a governance system that will help to achieve those goals and avoid those things um, that we fear. And obviously that means an open, transparent, robust uh, process of stakeholder engagement. Uh, and so that's the goal. Uh, and so with that, so um, we want to okay. open it up for discussion. Yeah, Matthew, we have another question here uh, from Paul Boyer and also a comment from Sonia Sanchez. I'll get the question first from Paul. Uh, in many areas, private domestic wells are the shallowest wells. Yeah. What protections have you seen for the scattered and sometimes dense wells? And then the comment from Sonia is, agree with Matthew that fair and equitable water allocations are needed for, for small farmers, environment, GDE, domestic wells, and small water systems serving disadvantaged communities. Hey, yeah, so let me, uh, this, this reminds me of, of, of an important comment I, I failed to make earlier too, which is that, you know, the allocation system is, is the basis for trade, uh, the basis for a marketing strategy, right? You, you, so you need a cap and then you need a clear, um, clearly defined system of allocating pumping. But the truth is that that's a first order priority, whether you're engaged in a market strategy or not. So this alloc in a sense, this allocation question is of critical importance. Um, uh, and in a sense, it almost lives outside the market. Like we believe our experience in Fox Canyon is that you must design an allocation system with the market in mind, right? Because there's actually allocation systems that are incompatible with, with market transfers. Um, but, but really that the allocation question here is an important one, whether or not we're going to engage in transfers, right? And so, so uh, the, the importance of disadvantaged communities uh, and access to water is critical, whether or not we're going to transfer, right? And so that allocation question is a, is a very, very, very important one. Uh, and one where disadvantaged communities need accurate, ac adequate representation in the design of the allocation system. Uh, and, and so actually, I may actually um, ask Aaron um, to comment on um, you know, the accounting framework and the treatment of disadvantaged communities in that system. But now, uh, just briefly before I ask him to do that, when we move to a system of transfers, the question we're asking is how is it that transfers of pumping might um, harm, have unintended consequences for disadvantaged communities? And the very, very clear one there, the very clear response to that is to, is to um, build buffer zones or management areas that actually don't allow net increases in pumping in the immediate neighborhood of, of shallow wells. Uh, so Aaron, do you wanna talk about the accounting framework and, and disadvantaged communities at all? Or is that best yeah. for a future? It, it, it will be uh, detailed in the future as we develop that and, and kind of elaborate on it, but the as many of you may have participated in previous meetings in the Kauia Subbasin, the, the Subbasin has adopted a water accounting framework with a structure that filters water through three buckets. A native bucket, which is one of natural uh, occurrences of water supply in the groundwater, precipitation, stream flows, and natural rivers. Foreign or, or uh, uh, supplies, which include imported surface water, such as uh, CBP frying current canal water that seeps into the groundwater. And then lastly is the most complicated one, salvage groundwater. And that's water for the benefit of the investment in the water supply. It accrues to the person who invests in it. So for that structure, based upon the investment or development of the water supply would accrue to the disadvantaged community. But at the base, you would receive the native uh, supply, which is approximately 10 inches per acre, uh, 0.83 acre feet per acre. Uh, however, if you're uh, in the community of Okieville, our landowners in Okieville pay 
um, the Tulare Irrigation District assessment rate. So for the benefit of becoming, they are a TID landowner at the end of the day, they would receive those same allocation credits. That currently standing. Again, this whole process is gonna help discuss all of that. Great. And so in other words, they would have, if, it, if a particular well is that of a disadvantaged community or the well, or a particular well is that of, a, of an agricultural water user, right? They would essentially get equal representation in the allocation process. Correct. By, right. by an acre foot per acre basis. Yep. Yep. Now it's a different footprint under which the APN resides, but yep. Of course, yep, yep, great. So any follow-up question there or additional questions? The audience is really lucky because I was given strict orders that I was not allowed to ask <laughs> questions. So, but please, you, you have one of the, the, the experts in this field here, here for your, at your disposal. If you have any questions, um, now is the time. We'll have more uh, at the end, but. Yeah, and Craig will talk about lots of different and, ways. To, yeah. And if you want me to back up to any slide for any of your questions, uh, any sort of clarifying questions, uh, happy to do that. Um, just uh, you either unmute yourself or raise your hand and uh, unmute your mic. Okay. I think without any, Craig, why don't you, um, oh, we've got one. Okay. <laughs> Logan Rob says, appreciate you, Aaron Fukuda's questions. <laughs> Just not my answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think without uh, that, I think what we ought to do is have, uh, oh, wait, we do have a hand up, it looks like. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, oh, it's Sobe. Sobe. Yes. Um, I'm involved with the Fox Canyon because I'm on a board of one of the entities that is in the lawsuit. And um, there's some interesting things going on there that I haven't heard you allude to, which are major problems. For example, it's turning out that for some of the bigger farmers, it's cheaper to pay the fine than it is to um, reduce their allocations. Um, that doesn't seem to be something that's working very well. And the litigation that is going on, which has been going on for some time, is bringing everything in Fox Canyon into uh, controversy. So I think when I look at trying to come up with a marketing plan for here, I'm interested in finding out the ways that we can learn from the litigants and other ones to try to avoid that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, great. So quick question. Are you involved in this in the um, Las Posas or the Oxnard Pleasant Valley adjudication? It's a I'll Fox ask. Canyon lawsuit. Well, so there's so uh, so for everyone's benefit within Fox Canyon, there's actually so the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency was created in the 1980s to uh, regulate pumping because of seawater intrusion that existed back then. They actually have three DWR designated basins. So the Oxnard Plain, which is the largest yeah. and actually has the most valuable agricultural land. There's the Pleasant Valley Basin and then the Las Posas Basins. The Las Posas mm -hmm. Basin is um, inland, uh, yes. has more homogeneous cropping patterns uh, and uh, less heterogeneous water use. The but Las Posas involved. Basin initiated an adjudication about three years ago. Uh, and so as a result of that, as we've designed the Fox Canyon water market, we have not mm -hmm. rolled it out in the... Um, in the Las Posas Basin because there were too many questions around the allocation system. Uh, we actually designed the Fox Canyon water market first to operate in the Oxnard Basin, partly because that's the biggest, has the most valuable land. Uh, and that has been running now for about four years and, and um, litigation and adjudication was just initiated over the allocation system. And so the primary question so currently, we allocate, the, the GSP allocates pumping in the Oxnard Basin based on um, historical use. Uh, and there are a number of growers that are challenging that through an adjudication, um, either because they would like some equal apportionment, um, or, or at least um, they would like at the end of the ramp down period to end at arrive, either equal apportionment today or arrive at equal apportionment after 20 years. And so that's the primary thing there. In terms of what you said about, um, about whether or not 
uh, people, whether or not the penalty is actually sufficient to stop people from pumping, this is obviously a first order condition. Whatever the system is for um, preventing people from over pumping, it has to actually be a binding constraint on pumping. Uh, and so there is, uh, I'm aware of one basin in particular, um, that, or sorry, not one basin, I'm, I'm aware of one user in particular that simply pays um, the, uh, the penalties sort of as an operating expense. They, they use a, a significant amount, uh, but for the overwhelming majority, you know, at $3,000, at $2,000 to $3,000 an acre foot, that's actually expensive enough that for most crops, um, they are not profitable. Uh, and so that's not to say they won't pay it. They might pay it um, you know, and lose money in a given year in order to maintain market share over time. Uh, um, but it is, that's something we've talked about a lot is that penalties um, need to be sufficient enough to stop people from paying them. I will also say this, that there has been tremendous interest in the water market in the last two years. Uh, in fact, um, one of our, so last year, um, uh, we had very robust participation, about 80% of all of the um, eligible wells were enrolled in the market. We allocate by well, not by parcel. Uh, and then about almost 50% of all of the participants actually engaged in trading activity. It was really remarkable. And we actually had one grower at the end of the year that was able to secure um, enough water to forego having to pay um, about $195,000 in surcharges. Uh, and so that's to say they were able to pay someone else not to pump at significantly lower cost uh, than paying the surcharge. Uh, and so, um, so in that case, again, um, I agree with you completely, Soapy. Penalties need to be sufficient that they actually stop over pumping. Um, but I, there's evidence that for the overwhelming majority of users, um, the penalty currently is enough to send a market to buy, to pay someone else not to pump or to prevent them from uh, paying that surcharge generally uh, with a few exceptions as I noted. Uh, and then again, in terms of the adjudication, we do have a big question about where the allocation system is gonna land. And so kind of like what, uh, what I think um, some of the GSAs may be contemplating in the next year in the Cahuilla Subbasin is that we have a temporary allocation system. Uh, we, we've operated with a temporary allocation system in the early years of the water market with an understanding that that would be replaced by a permanent allocation later. So we have three additional questions here, right. maybe about five minutes to cover them. Right. Uh, so from Andrew Hart, we have, what problems has the water market in Australia faced? They were held as an example at Fresno State Symposium. Now we hear it might not be working. Yeah, this is a great question. So they were literally held up as the gold standard. And I'll even confess that uh, six, seven years ago, I gave plenty of presentations where we held them up as, as the gold standard. Um, uh, and, and there have been a no, and, and the, the reality is that, that they, web, they did help Australia weather the millennial drought, uh, which is the worst drought at the time in the history of the continent. Uh, and was at was worse even than the seven year drought that California had a number of years ago, uh, and and it did that primarily by by extinguishing rice growing, uh, and so rice is a very low value crop, uh, and by establishing a water market structure before the millennium drought hit, um, basically they were able to pay rice growers to forego it's a lower value crop, and water was able to move to higher value crops and even to urban use. Urban water users actually benefited tremendously. From the market uh, in those days. So it was held up as a gold standard. Some cracks have emerged um, in, the, uh, in the foundation. Uh, one of the big problems they've had in the last year that has caused you know, revolts, literally protests, not riots, but protests uh, in Australia uh, is that um, stakeholders felt they were misled about the price of water and the future availability of water. So they allow both temporary and permanent transfers. So you can buy someone's water just for this year, or you can say, I want five acre feet forever, and I'm going to pay you to forego five acre feet forever. Uh, and so in the case of permanent transfers, what ended up happening is there were a lot of farmers, and it tended to be smaller operators, smaller farmers um, who were less familiar with, with water markets. They, they looked at the price of water and saw that it was very, very low, the, the, the lease rate, you know, the annual purchases. And they, and they said, well, I can get a big... There's this giant farming operation over here who's willing to pay me a huge amount of money for a permanent entitlement to that water right. 
And so many small farmers sold their permanent allocation and then immediately turned around and started leasing water back on an annual basis. And that worked for, for a few years of moderate to significant rainfall. And then they entered a new a, a second drought and the price of water, of course, went through the roof. That's not a bug. That's a feature, right? The price of water should be high when water is scarce. And they suddenly couldn't afford to, to lease the water as they had done um, during the uh, intermediate years. And so um, they really felt like they weren't educated and informed uh, and that they were cheated by the system. And then, of course, they're the small farmers. They see that the large operators had all the allocation they needed. Uh, and there was sort of a, it felt like their trust had been violated. Um, there's one other problem that I'm aware of, which is that, in, and I think this is really, really relevant to what we were just talking about with disadvantaged communities. Uh, in, uh, in the initial allocation system in Australia, which was actually, it's a little different because they, it's, it, it's facilitated by the national government, right? So this is a top-down sort of uh, government-run system, um, uh, which which has uh, its own pitfalls, uh, but there was no consideration given to environmental water use in the initial allocation system. Right here in California, we already have a significant, you know, 50% according to DWR of, of surface water flows are allocated to nature. Uh, and there, there was, no, there was no treatment of nature. And so what ended up happening is that after the allocation went through and the market um, system was developed, the national government had to end up going back and purchasing huge amounts of, person, uh, of permanent entitlement at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars in order to secure that water for nature. And so I think that's uh, a, a timely lesson uh, in, in our discussion because uh, you know, it highlights how um, you've got to get the allocation system right from the beginning, right? And that, uh, and that there's some very thorny questions around how you allocate the cap on, on groundwater pumping. But the reality is that those thorny issues exist whether or not you're going to trade water, right? These, un unfortunately, we can't escape those difficult questions. Um, the allocation system has to be done right whether or not we engage in a marketing strategy at all. Okay, <clears throat> next question is from Blanca Escobedo. Have you seen a difference in impacts between markets that allow trading across basin boundaries? Yeah, so, and so this is another one where Australia is often held up as the example. And so uh, what, all of the, what all of the case studies and papers and uh, water market experts are saying about Australia is that they didn't actually get significant gains, economic gains from trade for the, for the agricultural community. They didn't get investments in new water supplies that helped um, supply shortages until they allowed across basin boundaries. And so that's where you get the, the big economic bang for the buck. And that's also means that that's when investment dollars will flow in and create new water supplies. And so uh, that's often, that's one of the uh, sort of uh, things that's celebrated about the Australian approach. And again, because this whole thing is facilitated by the national government, they can actually regulate transfers, not only across basin boundaries, but across state lines. Uh, in, in Australia. Uh, and, so, and, and they have robust surface water delivery infrastructure in order to facilitate that. What we're talking about, uh, you know, that scares the heck out of me in, uh, in, the, in our context in California, right? In our case, you know, we have three basins in Fox Canyon. No one is talking about transferring water across basin boundaries anytime soon, right? The, the process has been difficult enough and humbling enough, we've learned so much already. Uh, you know, we made the choice to start really, really simple, to not even allow all transfers within a basin, right? To have sub, to have management areas within the basin, uh, and then to learn over time. Uh, and and so, you know, in our thinking, you know, to even consider transfers of water across basin boundaries um, uh, is would, would, is way, way, way down the road. Um, and obviously they involve physical deliveries of water. The simplest water market is an in-kind transfer. There's no delivery of water. It's, you know, it's, uh, if I wanna pump more water here, I pay someone not to pump water over there, right? And so, uh, and so this notion of, I, I understand the, that the, the lesson in Australia is that you'll get tremendous investment in new water supplies once you allow that, but boy, oh boy, um, 
there's a lot of learning that has to happen before you consider, I think, before you consider dramatic transfers of that nature. You know, Aaron's talked about within three, three miles, right? There's a lot to learn just moving up in three miles, never mind across the basin boundary. Okay. Let's see, in the interest of time, uh, I think we need to get moving on in the, the rest of the presentation. I have two questions here, one from an anonymous attendee and yeah. then Peter Nelson. I think we can hold those until our, our uh, Q&A session after uh, Laura Jensen's done with her presentation. So I'll go ahead and jump in on the public, how the public can participate as uh, Aaron and Matthew have uh, mentioned repeatedly, you know, the, the entire process is aimed to really make sure that the public and the beneficial users of groundwater and uses of groundwater have the opportunity to engage in this process. And we're trying to make sure that everything has ample opportunity for you to participate, not only in meetings like this, but also in, in uh, close one-on-one -on -one interactions with the project team. So one of on the the schedule here, the one thing I wanted to focus in on is you know right now we're we're at this point here in the public meetings where um, we're starting off and engaging all the stakeholders, and these little leader lines are intended for on on purpose. Uh, first off, one of them are set up in terms of being there when they occur at the conclusion of a major deliverable but they're also time to start with each major sequence. So when we have these workshops, uh, like the next one, we will talk specifically and get some of those, the input from you. We'll probably have some online polls and hopefully we'll be able to start meeting in person uh, and get through, get your, uh, your parameters, your requirements so that we can start developing these products based on your input and your feedback. And we also understand that in, oftentimes when we're in these sort of Zoom environments or even in the large group meetings, you want to have that one-on-one -on -one time with, say, Matthew or with Aaron. And so we're going to set up some uh, office hour times. We'll announce these on the TID website. And it'll most likely be a two-hour block. We'll open up a Zoom channel. And if you want to click on the link and go into the meeting, you can ask those questions directly of, of Matthew. And, and we'll just work through those, any sort of questions, concerns, thoughts, input, so that we really get the input from you on how to move forward with the study. And we'll be doing that throughout this entire process. And so common standard of each one is going to be, here's where we are in the deliverable. We're starting the next iteration of the project, and then we'll move forward. And so we'll continually have that input from you. Hey, Craig, can I just jump in mm -hmm. and say, we want what we hope to get uh, in, in each of these channels of communication is, is input and feedback of all kinds. So that means we want to know what individuals' goals are. We want to know what people are afraid of. We also want to know, hey, you know, in your presentation, you didn't mention this space and where they have a market, right? We also want you to be educating us, right? Our collective body of knowledge is significant, right? And so let us know what we should be thinking about or what we left out. Uh, you know, one of the things I lear I've learned in the years in Fox Canyon is I've, I, I know, I've learned what I don't know, right? It's been a humbling process. And I'm learning every single day. Uh, and so I, we encourage feedback of all kinds. Hey, you should have thought of this. Hey, I'm aware of this. Uh, like we, we want to build all of that, that collective body of knowledge so it's accessible to, to the public. And so again, you know, to develop this as a collaborative market development, uh, it'll have essentially four various areas that you can collect information. One is attending the, the uh, monthly stra uh, strategy committee meetings. We'll be holding those by Zoom. Uh, public's encouraged to attend these. Uh, as Aaron said earlier on, these will be noticed and consistent with the Brown Act. And we'll record these and post these on the MKGSA's uh, YouTube channel so that anyone that comes in late in the process can watch the videos and catch up and, and uh, be able to uh, participate based on a, that advanced uh, knowledge. Uh, again, we'll have these public workshops. We'll present the materials uh, uh, developed today for review and input. Um, these are intended to help uh, clarify potential market challenges and opportunities, and it also helps the strategy committee giving direction to the project team and how we move forward with the various deliverables under the project. And uh, all those materials will always be on the strategy committee's webpage on the Tulare Irrigation District's website. Um, for this first round of office hours, I think we'll probably uh, put the announcement of the time and date on the uh, TID's webpage either uh, tomorrow or uh, Friday and have those first sessions next week. 
And then the other is we do have uh, quarterly Kauia Sub-Basin Management Team committee meetings. This is where oftentimes the reports are updated on that. And then we have a GSA board meeting reports and then any sort of GSA advisory committee meetings. Uh, let's see. Gene, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Go ahead and unmute yourself. No, that was an accident. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. I think that was it. I just wanted to get through that quickly and hand it off to uh, Laura Jensen from State Water Resource Control Board. Hi, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Hi, um, I'm Laura Jensen. I'm the Assistant Executive Officer with the California Water Commission, and I'm so pleased to be here. Um, thank you for having me in, and it's fascinating to hear this discussion happening. The Commission is, um, I'm here to talk about the Commission's work on well-managed groundwater trading. We've been talking about it, but to be here at this meeting and to actually hear how things are playing out down there is very interesting. Also, following Matthew makes my job really easy. He did a great presentation. So um, thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll focus on just what, what well, um, let me just start by telling you a little bit about what the, who the commission is. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing. So the, the commission is a, a state entity. We've got up to nine governor appointed commissioners who represent different parts of the state and um, different water interests. We came about in the 1960s with the development of the state water project to provide some transpa public transparency and accountability for the SWP and still have some responsibilities for um, for some uh, oversight of, of the state water project operation and construction. But right now the commission's main focus is um, administering $2.7 billion of Prop 1 monies for the public benefits of water storage projects um, and then serving as a public forum for the discussion of water policy and management issues. And that's really where this work on groundwater trading um, hits home. Um, I will add that the commission meets monthly on the third Wednesday of the month, um, open public meetings. If anybody is interested in joining right now, we're all virtual. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. So the work that we're doing on groundwater trading is, is born of the governor's water resilience portfolio. And there's an action in the portfolio that asks the state to think about how to support groundwater trading while ensuring that it's done without negative consequences for the environment for communities and for smaller farmers, exactly what Matthew hit on earlier. Um, so we've been asked, this, this action is formally assigned to DWR, to Department of Fish and Wildlife, to the Water Board, and to Department of Food and Ag, who is not listed on the slide, but should be. But we've been asked, the commission has been asked to use its public forum to go out and better understand um, the concerns and the um, opportunities around groundwater trading, and then to explore how the state can help um, to enable it while also protecting water users who could be impacted by it. So that's what brings me here tonight. Um, I wanna just hit on the fact that the state doesn't have the authority to tell a GSA or a local entity that it must trade or that it can't trade or how to trade. So all the discussions you're having, you know, all, all of those rules uh, that, that's all happening at the local level. We're exploring what the state can do within its current authorities um, and or where there might be opportunities to expand what the state can do. Next slide. Um, so this is a quick overview of our time frame. Uh, we spent the past several months hosting expert panels at our standing commission meetings, having some small group conversations to frame the issues that are at play here. Right now we are in, I think there's an animation, if you wouldn't mind hitting it one more time. Uh, yep, that's where we are right now, um, in that red box. So we're having public discussions um, and we are, this, this opportunity tonight is part of our localized outreach where we're dropping into standard standing meetings to just better understand um, or kind of ground truth what we've heard to date. So I'm, I'm really hoping to get feedback from this group, you know, your thoughts, comments, opinions, questions, if I left anything out. Um, all of this goes into crafting our white paper, which is the end product of the commission's engagement on groundwater trading at this time. And it's really a guidance document for those implementing agencies for what they're going to do next to implement this portfolio action. Next slide. 
So I think, you know, Aaron did a great job of talking about why groundwater trading, you know, what, why it might be used as a tool. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this one. Next slide. And then Matthew did a great job of talking about the potential negative impact. So, you know, we're, we're basically kind of living in this world where we, we understand there's opportunities with groundwater trading, but we also understand that there are deep concerns about cones of depression and um, migrating contaminant plumes impacting drinking water users or um, reducing flows in rivers that species, particularly listed species, might um, be dependent upon. Um, so those are the types of negative impacts that, that the state is interested in um, helping to avoid. Next slide. And this slide just talks about some of the rules. Again, Matthew already did a great job of talking about this. Um, so, you know, these are the, the types of things that you guys are, are looking at at, at a local level um, and a, a facet of, of well-managed groundwater trading. Next slide. So I want to just share a little bit about what we've learned to date um, so that you can understand, you know, what we've heard and, and, and help contribute to it. So these cross-cutting themes are, are high-level concepts that have, that have come out of the conversations that we've had. And it's really kind of the context in which um, the groundwater trading conversations are happening. We've heard a lot about trust. Um, and, and again, we've also been talking to folks both in the state and outside of the state and the country and trust has come up time and time again as being absolutely critical trust person to person trust as well as trust in institutions um, and there's been some acknowledgement that there's a a, a a sort of a gap there due to some his long-standing historic issues surrounding trust we've heard a lot about groundwater trading being part of a larger groundwater management effort groundwater trading alone is not going to solve sustainable groundwater management but it could be a, an effective tool to help lessen the burden of ratcheting down groundwater use. It's also completely dependent upon the things that you've already heard about tonight. Um, you know, a, a, a sound allocations, water accounting, sound water budget. So it, it's really embedded in this larger context. And then good data. So, you know, understanding those third party impacts takes um, some understanding of what's happening within the basin and where they're likely to occur. So there's data needed to both design the program, but then also to see what's happening during the program. We've heard about starting small, both geographically and temporally. Certainly, we've heard about market power and gaming the system. People have expressed their concerns about wealthy entities driving up prices, user blocks dictating where water goes, or just lie, outright lying and coercion. Um, and then we've heard pretty consistently that the st state does have a role to play. Um, so that while this tool is going to be designed locally, the state can or should play a role. Next slide. So this is a lot of words just talking about what that picture of well-managed groundwater trading is starting to look like based on the conversations that we've had. And, you know, I, I don't want to, I won't walk through everything. I think we've already talked about a lot, but I did want to point out that um, the, the concept of good governance being in place prior to starting a trading program has come up because governance will be tested with this new revenue stream coming in. So that that's something that's come up a fair amount. Um, and then, you know, what I'm really appreciating is this sort of stakeholders need to be fully engaged. That's been absolutely critical. That helps understand the third party impacts and leads to designing these um, well designed, clear trading rules that have buy in. Um, the other thing that I, I want to um, hit on is that, you know, it's come up very frequently that there needs to be a means of monitoring and reporting on what happens in the market. That's part of transparency. And then a mitigation plan, should there be negative impacts? So, you know, some have described a system of triggers that provide a sort of an early warning system um, to a GSA so that um, before an impact happens, they can change or curtail the activity that's happening. Um, and, and we also heard from some of our out-of-state examples, just as a reminder, that it, it takes money to run these programs, right? And you're going to need some sort of efficiency of operation for turning around trades. So just thinking about kind of the resourcing end of these programs. Next slide. So we're heading into some workshops tomorrow and Friday, we're hosting public workshops and we're gonna probe on some of these points of divergence. So these are some areas where there are some discrepancies, confidentiality versus transparency. You know, some are, are, are calling for um, complete transparency in terms of market data um, to better understand what's happening in the, in the market, keep, it, keep the information accessible and the market accessible. But then there are legitimate concerns about pro protecting proprietary information. So we're gonna explore that in our workshops as well as customization versus standardization. You know, what, what level of customization makes sense for efficiency's sake 
I'm sorry, standardization makes sense for efficiency's sake versus customization to sort of allow for flexibility and um, and um, ingenuity to happen given a, a specific um, place. And then there's this big question of local control versus state oversight. Um, this is one of the bigger points of divergence that we're dealing with because we're exploring the state's role. And again, there's general consensus around the need for um, local design of groundwater trading programs and for the state to play some role. But some feel that the state should only play the role that it's already that's already described under Sigma. And others feel much more strongly that the state needs to be there as a backstop should there be negative consequences. The state needs to be prepared to, to step in in that instance. So that's all stuff that we're gonna be exploring at our, our workshops. Next slide, please. As well as probing more on what role the state might play. So we've started to bin up some examples of what the state could do in terms of providing information and education, um, potentially continuing to convene people, provide forums for discussions of groundwater trading or online clearinghouse. The state's already providing technical and financial assistance, as you know, but is there a way to target it towards specific needs for groundwater trading programs? The state could provide guidance and minimum standards, ensuring metrics and monitoring in are in place. This could be voluntary, sort of a here are some things you might consider doing. Could be best management practices. It could be a here are the standards that you need to meet in order to be eligible for state resources or even a state certification program. Um, you know, the human right to water is really embedded in a lot of these other roles, but the end goal there would be to ensure safe and affordable water for human health and consumption. And then we get to that, that question of enforcing safeguards for vulnerable users and, and where might the state come in there. Um, you know, at, at this point, the state doesn't have the authority to step in and, um, and kind of serve as an enforcement arm unless something in Sigma is triggered. Um, but maybe there's an opportunity for the state to provide um, some means of communication to hear from third parties, to hear from stakeholders about what's happening, um, to, to keep that ear to the ground. So, and we're open to, you know, other thoughts or sort of refining what we have up here. Next slide. So, these are the discussion questions that I'd like to leave you with. You know, what do you think about trading programs? Is it likely to impact or benefit you? What would make it work well? And what role um, would you like to see the state play? Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear from folks tonight, time permitting, um, if the organizers think it's appropriate. Um, but also, you know, we'll be working on this for the next several months if people want to reach out to me. Or I really hope that people might come to our workshops. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I've got a little bit more information about our workshops on there. So we've got one tomorrow afternoon and then one on Friday morning. Um, there's information about how to register on our website. We also have a workbook on our website and that workbook really walks through everything we're going to talk about at the workshop, um, including the questions that we're going to pose. So if you're unable to attend the workshop, you can always look through the workbook and respond to those questions and send it in to us. Um, but again, you know, would love to have your input there. And then the last slide is just my contact information so that you have a, a means of getting a hold of me. And again, I want to say a big thank you to um, letting me talk to you tonight. Thank you, Laura. We do have a pair of questions in the chat room uh, addressed to you. First one's from Chuck Nichols. The question is, how are disadvantaged communities and small and medium-sized farms defined within the objective to support them through groundwater trading policy? There is no definition um, of those at this point. I think that you know there, there are various definitions of disadvantaged communities that are used for state funding programs. Um, I don't know enough to kind of weigh the, the pluses and minuses of different ways of, of that. At this point, I do think that there is a need to better define small to medium farms. I think that's one of the things that will probably come out of our conversations because nobody's quite sure how to do it. Um, but we've heard some good examples um, from some of the stakeholders that we're working with of, of ways to sort of localize that approach based on um, not just size of the, the land that's farmed, but the types of crops are grown, the types of markets that are accessed, um, things like that. Okay. And then from Paul Boyer, is there an intent to protect owners of private domestic wells that are not necessarily in communities from their wells growing dry? Yes, there is an, I mean, the, the state's interest is ensuring that drinking water wells don't go dry. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, let's see. We do have uh, some questions here in the queue from uh, addressed to Matthew. I think, um, uh, Craig, I think yeah. there's one that Peter, before Laura, there was a what does safe and affordable water mean? And 50 gallon, oh, yep. 55 gallons per capita per day, overlying allocated rights or something other. Is this a question to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, Laura. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good question. I I I, I can't answer that question. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. So our anonymous question, uh, Matthew, in your experience studying water markets, have you seen unintended consequences involving disadvantaged communities, i.e. cones of depression, uh, movement of contaminant plumes? My biggest concern in this region is that not all parties will agree to metering. Are there ways to counteract parties who choose not to meter participate in the market, thus worsening the situation? You're on mute, Matthew. Uh, so for the first part of the question, there are, I am not aware of any um, case studies or papers that specifically discuss the impacts to disadvantaged communities in existing water markets. And so um, just this is a, uh, an open call. If anybody is aware of, of those words, trading induced, right? So I'm certainly familiar of, um, you know, the impacts of declining water levels on disadvantaged communities, but where it's actually a trading induced, you know, that without trade, they would have been fine. And that because of trade, their well went dry. Uh, I am aware, as I mentioned, of, of water markets that have protections like the, the buffer zones around municipal wells um, in Nebraska. Uh, and so again, I, I encourage if people are aware of stuff, um, please bring that to our attention. And what we'll do is we'll build out, uh, you know, some way to publicly share a lot of this, those case studies and other information. Uh, in terms of the um, issue of metering, you know, so again, what's interesting about this is that th it feels like this is not necessarily a water market or water marketing specific question, right? A fundamental question for basins that are seeking to achieve sustainable management and to significantly reduce groundwater pumping over 20 years. You know, there's a there's a fundamental question about about the role of monitoring. In, in those as a management strategy in under Sigma, right? And that's independent of, of uh, whether trading happens or not. What's interesting is I, you know, I'll use the example of Fox Candy is I think there's a unique opportunity to use the incentives that markets can create to change the feasibility of some monitoring strategy. So as I mentioned, um, in Fox Canyon, it was the agricultural users who insisted, they said, if we are going to have um, a, a system for transferring pumping, we must have the highest level of monitoring and oversight available. Uh, and so, uh, and what's unique about that story in Fox Canyon is that eight years earlier, the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency, which had been requiring metering since the, since, uh, the early 90s, actually um, actually uh, debated an ordinance, uh, implementing an ordinance to impose um, telemetric monitoring. And it was a non-starter. Growers said absolutely no way, no how, right? The current system is enough. Most basins aren't even metered and reported like we have been for years. But the minute we started talking about a water market, it was the growers who said, I need the value of my water protected. And they insisted on metering. And so and what's interesting there is it was compulsory. Growers insisted that it be required not just of people who are participating in the market, but of all water users. And so I think that speaks to the incentives involved once a basin commits to engaging in a water marketing strategy. Uh, it also hints that there's a couple different approaches, right? Uh, one is to uh, you know, have opt-ins for people who, who grow, uh, who are gonna participate in the market. Uh, and, and perhaps having a, a less stringent monitoring regime for those who aren't. Uh, but uh, uh, but I, I actually think that's, that is perhaps not as hard a problem as, as, as is generally understood because this is, you know, the monitoring strategy needs to be developed whether or not uh, a basin is going to engage in trading. Okay. We have a pair of questions here from uh, Peter Nelson. Um, 
are there software packages that could be used to handle these markets? And if so, what are they? And the second yeah. one was the fees associated with groundwater treating and the Fox Canyon GMA. And then just may want to yeah. add on to this, what we're planning to do related to this very topic. Okay, so what's interesting is that, so you'll notice I haven't talked about electronic trading platforms, right? So what's so, what, and, and again, I have some very strong ideas about good market design. Uh, uh, and what's and to me the the trading platform is the easiest part. It's what you do at the end after you do all the tremendously hard work of allocating water, um, protecting, uh, you know, mitigating adverse third party impacts. Uh, at the end, you will have a number of choices, and so there are there are currently off the shelf platforms uh, uh, providing various degree. You know. You could design the market, follow, you know, you could pick from the menu of options that we have uh, outlined today, design a market, and there is an electronic trading platform that is, that is um, uh, compatible with that system. Right? Fox Canyon, uh, uh, we have a, pr a, a proprietary system designed specifically for the unique anonymized structure and the algorithmic matching that's used. Um, uh, interestingly, in the Twin Plat, they have a, a third-party exchange administrator uh, that implements an algorithm, but then executes par uh, paper transfers, right? Where there's paper filing, uh, uh, and so so again, there's a there's a number of solutions there, and in a sense, that's the easy part um, that you address at the end. And so, one of the in terms of our work plan, um, you know, originally the the request for proposals for the uh, the consulting team to work on a water marketing strategy actually had evaluating electronic trading platforms as an element to that. And that's something we've just, that is now, I'll let Aaron speak to this, that's been put off. That will be a totally separate task that happens at the end after we have um, designed the water marketing strategy. Aaron, do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, that we, we've been uh, uh, approached by several individuals trying to, you know, uh, hey, buy the platform and then you develop the market, you know, so buy the platform first and then develop the market. And that didn't seem like a good forward thinking path we decided to develop the market first develop the rules and then uh, look at the model we also felt that our we wanted to bifurc a bifurcation between the team that's going to help us develop the rules and the software platform because oftentimes they're the one and the same so we don't want somebody leading us also to the platform right so we we did create a separation of that um, and we are going to develop the rules first and then and then look out for that software that best fits those rules. And like Matthew said, it could be a custom piece of software um, or it could be an off the shelf. But we're going to concentrate on the rules and the, the parameters which our, our public wants uh, addressed first. Then we'll go find the tool. So. Or it could be a paper transfer that doesn't involve software at all right so there's there's a wide range of, of choices available i'm gonna lean away from the paper thing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. all right we all have right a question, yeah. a question yeah. here from uh, johnny gailey to matthew yeah. what are the typical maximum physical distances that groundwater trading is happening in existing markets and how would that relate in the Cahuilla subbasin so this is a great question. And so the, the, my, the next time you, I use the presentation I just gave, I'm going to build physical distance in as a parameter. I actually don't, I haven't looked at that across all of those basins, but that's easy enough to do. Uh, and so that's a great, um, uh, that's a great question for me to work on, you know, in all those 19 adjudicated basins and in all those other water markets, what are the typical and what are the maximum physical distances that transfers are allowed? Obviously, what we care about here is the, the physical distance of a transfer of pumping, right? Um, and so uh, uh, with surface water deliveries, there's a whole other issue with having to do with, um, you know, uh, system losses and that kind of stuff. But, uh, but uh, at least physical distance of groundwater transfers, I'll look into that for all those basins. I know in Fox Canyon, you know, this is easy enough to look up um, the Oxnard Basin, you know, is probably 100 square miles, maybe. Uh, it might be 10 miles by 10 miles. Uh, and, and in that case, it is actually possible, depending on the direction you're transferring it, to move it um, all the way from one corner of the basin to the other. I will look in the case of um, the Edwards Aquifer. That would be an interesting question because that's a much, much bigger basin, um, more in line with the scale of 
for you. So I'll get back to you with that information. Okay. Yeah, and Matthew, I think in Arizona, right in the Scottsdale area, those folks are allowed to transfer completely out of the, I mean, it's like on the other side of a mountain range and right. that's created the problems that they're in there. They're moving water cre credits from a geographically completely different part of the state. And it's, it, it's now reflecting the issues. So, yeah. Okay, and we have a question here from Dave V. G. Uh, it's related also to the physical distance of pumping. Uh, and I'll just kind of summarize here. Are we talking about trading credits or not physically moving pumped water? Does this apply to pumped water or does this apply to, and how does this apply to the Kahuya Basin? Dave, if I got that wrong, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So it was more the first half of the question that was more was my concern. You you mentioned about the buffering around um, communities since we're not actually physically moving the water, pumped water, we're moving credits. Uh, would that apply to what we're trying to do here? Uh, so in the case, the example I was illustrating, they are what we would call in-kind transfers of pumping. So you're not physic, you're not pumping the water, moving it across the land. You're just transferring the right to pump uh, or the allocation of pumping. Uh, and so in, in these case, the buffer zones and the special management areas restrict the geographic area within which you may move the location of the pumping. Now, there's a question for stakeholders in, in, uh, uh, in the Kuya subbasin. You know, obviously, there's already systems for transferring surface water delivery. Uh, uh, well, I think what we're talking about is, a, is purely trading pumping allocation. But, but there's, a, there's an interesting question there around the interplay between surface water and groundwater. Uh, and so you know, these are, this is something we need to talk about uh, within the basin. Okay, we have a comment here from Dave Martin. It's very important that, as stated earlier, the geographic areas remain small to begin with so that air, one area is not oversold. Also, there are entities out there that are ready to pounce on available water and take it out of the area. They buy land for the water, not to farm. The water marketing plan may need to be accelerated, but needs to be buttoned up so that some loophole is not found and used to the basin's detriment. Yeah, uh, so agree completely. You know, uh, what was interesting in the process that we employed in Fox Canyon is we, uh, so it was 100% stakeholder driven. So in that case, it was the stakeholders that designed and and recommended the, the, the uh, water marketing strategy to the regulatory body, which became the GSA. But uh, in that process, during those seven months that we were meeting, we invited people who operated water markets from around the world. And we actually heard from somebody who designed the market in the Twin Flat and the, and we, we had got an admonishment. We had actually heard the Australians the week before say, oh, this is easy. Just give us some rules. You'll, we'll set up the eBay of water. You'll be trading water. And then the very next meeting, we had um, the folks from the Twin Platte, and they said, this is the hardest thing you're ever going to do. Every time you turn around, you're going to discover an unintended consequence. Start simple, start small, and learn over time. Uh, and, and those are words we really took to heart, and, and, it's, uh, and we benefited from it. In, in too many ways to count. Uh, you know, so having an adaptive approach that, that expands temporarily and geographically over time and, and, and as a system for learning and then incorporating what's learned um, into the structure of the market. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Colin, you had a, look like you started a question here. Do you wanna unmute yourself? Uh, let's see, will this trading be native yield or tiered water as well? And I believe this is for Aaron to respond to. Yeah, Colin, so what you're addressing is um, kind of where we're at today, right, with this um, in, uh, interim or emergency plan that we're putting in place to kind of address our current downward trend in groundwater levels. And right now, what we're looking to do is to allow growers to trade. There, most Our three emergency plans that we're discussing in the Kuya Subbasin at least have three tiers of water, native, tier one, and tier two. And what I will say just simply for right now is we're, we're promoting that you should be able to move two of those tiers and leave one behind, right? So you can't, you can't evacuate all the, the groundwater that is associated with that property. There's a leave behind. 
but that is again, um, as we explained, and the, there'll be a little bit of confusion, but we're trying to keep a very clear line. This, what we're doing currently today is an emergency plan to address the ongoing drought and our declines in groundwater levels. And our water marketing strategy is the long-term plan under which we will operate, which we are planning to utilize the water accounting framework. And um, I think I can answer the anonymous question here with, with that segue is, did Sigma essentially eliminate landowners' water rights? In my mind, as a water resources manager, Sigma defined water rights for landowners. It leveled the playing field and established how we're gonna become sustainable in the near future and far future. So um, for once there was a definition of the inputs and the outputs so that we could apply those water rights like our water accounting framework. Um, there's many that will you know, not agree with my viewpoint on that, but uh, that is my, I guess, personal and professional viewpoint of what Sigma did for us. It defined our water rights and leveled the playing field for folks so that we can become sustainable. Okay. We have a question here from Gene Kilgore. Will there be allowances of transferring surface water for groundwater between parties? And Matthew, maybe this might be a question to answer well, where we're going to address yeah, that. When I will process. obviously uh, this, we can add this to the menu of choices. There's, you know, this is one of the, the things that, um, that will need to be considered. You know, there are, what's interesting is uh, there are actually um, water markets again, that have an interplay between surface water and groundwater. And actually in some cases, you know, for example, there may be surface water systems where not every water user has a turnout on some surface water delivery system, doesn't, can't actually receive a delivery of surface water. And in that case, there are markets that bridge the gap by trading groundwater in lieu, right? So the idea is in those markets is that people who have access to surface water deliveries take the surface water and forego their pumping and then sell the right to pump the, the allocate that at pumping allocation to another user who doesn't have access to surface water. And so again, these are, there are uh, examples where there are strategies like that. And those are so-called in lieu transfers uh, where you're trading groundwater in lieu of surface water to benefit those who don't have access to surface water deliveries. Here's an interesting one too, Matthew, that that's been playing out in my mind. You know, we have a subsidence issue in our Southwest portion of our district, and we may need to trade surface water for groundwater to move the groundwater pumping outside of the subsidence zone. And those growers may need to actively participate in order to actually get more water, right? So they're gonna, they'll get more surface water in exchange, some pumper will have to go into another area and pump uh, without the subsidence impact, so. Yeah. Yeah, and interestingly, uh, again, this is this is an issue that potentially is outside uh, that you need to address whether or not you're transferring groundwater. Uh, you know, there are adjudicated basins um, that I'm aware of. Also, Fox Canyons um, dealt with this years before they engaged in a marketing strategy where they actually built a pipeline to deliver surface water to irrigators in the pumping trough, and they were required to take surface water deliveries whenever they were available instead of their pumping. Uh, and so again, that's, a, that's actually a, potentially an allocation question that, um, that, uh, that needs to be addressed whether or not you're engaged in a marketing strategy. Okay. I think that was the last question that we had in the queue and I don't see anything in the chat room. Everyone does have the opportunity to unmute their own phone and ask a question if they like or raise your hand. You know, this might be a good opportunity too, if any of our committee members would like to make any comments or um, would they, almost all of them are here with us today, mixed in with the crowd. So these folks, if, I, I, if you know them, please thank them. They're, they're putting up a significant amount of time and energy. They, we've asked them to read things um, and, and look at things and engage in a conversation and and we've got a lot of work if you look at our schedule ahead of us. So um, I've uh, it, we picked a very good committee. They're very engaged. Um, they're talking and calling and, and reading. So um, if you guys have anything you'd like to comment on, um, please do so. Mm 
Aaron, this is Chuck um, Nichols. I would uh, say I appreciate um, the first of these forums. The, the reason uh, it's the most valuable to me is see what, what kind of other questions are out there and to try and learn what concerns are um, and what other tasks the committee needs to consider through this process. I do think, unfortunately, given the severity of, uh, of the drought that we have and the critical groundwater levels, we're going to get to see what um, groundwater transfers without an effective market look like over the next year. Um, and I guess the only benefit of that will be that uh, we'll have uh, the committee and the group will learn how to put a, hopefully the, the pilot market together better in the future. Because if you don't have a market and people start trading groundwater, then you're gonna have all sorts of local sigma impacts and broader sigma impacts. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by the attendance and the concern and, um, and I look forward to the future public sessions. Manny Leon, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to everyone on this committee and thank you to Dr. Finup for presenting the information so thoroughly and um, in a very digestible manner. I just wanted to give him and everyone on this committee a big shout out. And I'm very excited to the work that is going to be put into this project moving forward. And that is all. Thank you. Hey, we look forward to getting to know you uh, and, and lots more conversations. And I think we're about on time, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I think um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for you know participating in this great discussion from folks. I think for Matthew, Craig, the committee, our chair, Steve Nelson and I, there were things that I heard today that, that uh, are definitely piquing my interest. And so there's a lot more to come in the near future. Um, uh, Chair Nelson, did you have any closing remarks? Otherwise, we'll let everybody go enjoy their evening. The only thing I would say is I appreciate everybody attending tonight. This is kind of a high level view. We've disseminated a lot of information. I would encourage everyone to get engaged. I would encourage everyone to submit questions via email or one of the uh, office hours kind of time frame uh, because we need this kind of an input if we're gonna come up with a program that's impactful for our basin and benefits the constituents we all serve. So thank you. Also like to thank the Water Commission. Laura, thank you for uh, attending today, getting the word out. I, I, I see our parallel programs. I think they're working well together. So thank yeah, you for thank joining you. us. Thanks for having me in. And yeah, join, uh, join us for a, an office hour. It makes me feel young again, right, <laughs> Matthew? <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you. Have a great evening for and thanks for the successful first workshop. <laughs>